have been discussing, I think this is week five, of discussing the nature of God. And we have a new person here who's never been here before. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you. Um, just to give you a quick overview of uh, what we do in the class, it's very relaxed, uh, mostly informal, and we really like discussion. Um, opinions and asking questions and that kind of thing, so feel free to, to raise your hand and chime in at any point. Um, but in general, we, we meet together uh, to learn more about our God, more about uh, the word that he's given us, more about uh, Christianity and the life that he's established for us. And so it's all with that uh, purpose. And there, there's, there's a large degree of... Uh, but we really want to avoid intellectualism for its sake, if that makes sense. Intellectualism mm -hmm. for its sake. So there's a, there's a serious danger that can come with seeking understanding for the sake of understanding in itself. And this is actually a warning in the Bible. It says knowledge itself puffs up, but wisdom is what you want to search for. And wisdom is knowledge lovingly applied. So we want to take the knowledge for the sake of lovingly applying it to our lives and our relationships with God and our own ability to uh, speak about the truth of God to a world that denies him, so evangelism. But, uh, so we've been talking about all that, and in general, again, we're, we're fairly informal in here um, for the sake of having some kind of established classroom rules, uh, respect whoever has the floor. I'm teaching the class, so that'll be me most of the time. But uh, just, you know, raise your hand, and so there's a, you know, uh, stay in line and order and everything. And then, no matter what we're doing, because the fact is, especially with this subject right here, it can, we were running into some very controversial subjects. And it was your first week last week, and we immediately jumped into some really hard stuff, some yes. very difficult questions. But none of us are coming in here with an agenda, saying, I'm going to prove myself right, or I'm going to affirm my presuppositions or whatever. We're all coming in here saying, I, I want to learn. Even if I come in here disagreeing with anything that's been heard, that's, that's fine. I'm not in here to convince you guys of something. In fact, I'm, I'm presenting, we're looking at every scripture that relates to a, a question from all different sides of, a, of opinion. We're looking at four major views of the nature of God as opposed to just my view. I'm not even telling you what my view is. We're just looking at them for the sake of trying to learn and understand God and our life better. Um, so the, the core rule of this class is just be loving. Be loving as you learn, be loving as you discuss, be considerate of other people, and overall that just creates a really wonderful atmosphere to be learning in, because we're Christians and we're united in seeking truth together. That's awesome. So awesome. So we've been talking about why we want to study this, and, and once again, I, I think the, the biggest reasons are that the more you understand God, and we, uh, we looked at this, it's a little hard because we're on week five of the series, so both of you are coming in. Well, John as well. You haven't been a part of this, uh, this series either. Both of you guys are coming in, you know, a, a, a bit of the ways in. So you've missed some of the establishing stuff. But we try to design the class so that it's something that you can come in and learn from the get-go. If you want the full experience and all the establishment and the proofs and evidences and that kind of thing, we have all the videos online, which is awesome. But bottom line, God calls us to seek knowledge of him. And to know him and to understand him more. He says, if anyone's going to boast, let him boast in that, that he knows me, that he understands me. This is what we want to do. We want to understand how God works. We want to stand, understand the kind of reality that he has created and the way he rules over us and interacts with us and, and the way he works. And, and again, I think the more we understand him, the easier it is to worship him because he's so great. And that's what we want to go after. And also because a lot of very difficult questions that are posed and attacked uh, or used as attacks against Christianity come from this area, the nature of God, and the questions that come off of it. But there are people who will not come to Christianity and will not even consider the Judeo-Christian God until they have some of those intellectual walls broken down. I was one of those people years ago. And so we need to be able to provide a defense for the hope that is within us. That's the Apostle Peter. Who said that? So anyway, this is why we come, this is why we talk about this stuff at all. Not just simply to have knowledge or to win a debate or whatever else, but to deepen our own relationships with God and to be able to uh, provide a defense for the hope that is within us to a world that 
calls for it. So we've been talking about a lot of different stuff and it's been really, really cool. Um, there's no way I can do a, uh, a just summary for you guys in you know, five minutes or so. But uh, again, we have all the videos available for you to check them out online and try to catch up. But bottom line, we've been looking at four different views of God's nature. And these would be what you call the major views. And there are other viewpoints that would be kind of subsets of these things or extremes on the far left or far right. But these are the four major ones that you'd find the majority of Christians landing in today. And so the first one is what you'd call hyper-Calvinism or fatalism. And very simply, and this is going to be an inadequate summary, but here it is for you guys who are just coming into this fresh. This is the view that God preordains everything that has happened or will ever happen. God preordains everything. He's in full control of us. There is no free will in this picture whatsoever. Everything we're doing or will ever do, or anyone will ever do, is controlled by God. The fact that I'm saying these things and discussing that this is even a view was preordained by God from the foundations of the earth. So that's number one. Number two is what you'd call Reformed theology. And Reformed theology is the view that, well, the defining characteristic of this view, and there's a lot that goes into it, but the defining characteristic is God chooses some to be saved and not others. This idea called election, preordained to salvation. Because according to Reformed theology, all men are what's called totally depraved. We cannot come to God on our own. We cannot do good by our own devices. We only do evil. And so God picks some of us by no virtue of our own. He chooses some of us to be able to be regenerated and to be able to come to him. And those are the ones who are saved and the ones he does not choose are, well, they're condemned to damnation. So this is the defining characteristic of Reformed theology, and there's more than that, but I'm just trying to get through this quickly, and we can move on to the verses. And number three is what you call Armenianism. And Armenianism is the view that God foreknows everything will ever happen, but does not foreordain it. He doesn't control like a hyper-Calvinism, and he also doesn't just choose some and not others. He calls to everyone and tries to pull everyone to him. But he knows who's going to come to him and who won't. He knows exactly what we're going to do from the beginnings of the earth. He's not controlling us, but he knows what we'll do. Uh, complete and utter foreknowledge. The future, according to Arminianism, Arminianism, exists in terms of concrete reality. And finally, we have open theism. Open theism gets its name from its view that the future is open and not concrete. In other words, the future doesn't exist in terms of concrete reality. It's just a, a concept. And so we have, this believes that we have free will, complete free will to choose God or to not choose God, to choose sin or to not choose sin, and that the future is open because of that. And so God is genuinely interactive and he's genuinely responding to our choices and so on and so forth. And again, this is a super, super uh, brief and inadequate summary because we spent an entire hour looking at these four views and strengths and, weak, strengths and weaknesses of each view. But these, this is uh, the best I can do in a short time frame without spending too much time. And so we've been looking at major questions uh, concerning the nature of God and the response that these four things would give to them. And we're, we're not trying to say, okay, and this one's right, or this one's right, or whatever. We're trying to say, here are the common views. Here's where, where they hold. There's really, chances are that one of these are right or very close to right. This is, these are the four major views from a solid 2,000 years of theological development. Um, I'd be very shocked if 100 or 500 years from now there was... Now, these are all thrown out, and there's some new view. These are the, these are the four, and they've been the four for 2,000 years. Um, in some cases, even before that, with Jewish uh, theology. 
But uh, bottom line, we're not trying to say this one's right or that one's right or whatever. We're trying to say, okay, here are the views. And let's look at the questions and how do these things respond to the questions and which one of them lines up best with scripture. And even then, I'm not going to tell you which one of them lines up best with scripture. Because there's some scriptures that are going to appear to support, say, hyper-Calvinism and not Arminianism, Roman Deism, or Reformed theology. There are some scriptures that are going to appear to support Reformed theology and not hyper-Calvinism. It's going to go back and forth like that. But the bottom line is the, the Bible is not, doesn't contradict itself. These things are mutually exclusive, and we tend to kind of cross lines with the views and beliefs of these things, but they can't all be right. God can't both let us have free will and control everything we do. That doesn't make sense. Yes? I had sort of a thought as far as the whole election of the saved idea and it's not like a fully formed theory, it's just something I thought of and it's like a parallel to something else. It's like, you know, when you have, um, like whatever you're, whatever you're, it's kind of like, you know, do, do people focus on, it's like, do we have the, you know, it's like, do I have the gift of playing music or is it just something I chose to do and did put in the work to be able to do it? Am I, you know, Am, am I chosen to be saved, or did I just choose to do it and put in the work towards understanding God kind of thing? So it's like, I don't know, I, I feel like, I don't, I don't really like that idea of election because it kind of seems like, it kind of seems like everybody should have a shot at it kind of thing. It seems like everybody, if they wanted to, could do it. Okay. Just thought. Yeah, and we're going we're gonna to be going there. We are, because there are, there are verses that seem to say that God elects some and not others. Mm -hmm. And there are other verses that seem to say that God wants everyone to be saved. So they can't both be true. Make sense? They can't both be true. So we've got to try to figure out, and we've got to be thinking for ourselves. I'm not going to necessarily tell you, now this one is true and that one's not true. We have to be thinking for ourselves. And that's the Berean a way of going about uh, approaching Scripture. So last week, we looked at our first major question in diving into Scripture, and the question was, uh, the question was, does the will of God always happen on earth? In other words, are there some things that happens that God does not want to happen? And so we looked at two Scriptures that spoke to that, uh, the debate, turn out the two trickiest Scriptures that spoke to the, uh, to the matter. Um, if you want to check that out, we have the video up, well... I don't, it is up. Yes. It's up because you saw it. Yeah. Um, we have the video up from last week, but uh, we're going to be moving forward into another major question. Any questions or thoughts as we move forward? Okay. Oh, no. It was not the right button. <laughs> okay, so here's the uh, next major question, and this one's a doozy. This one's very fun. This is the kind of question that well, depending on what school you land in, people would call you wicked or a heretic for even asking the question. But the problem is, there are verses that seem to say yes, and there are verses that seem to say no. So they can't both be right. Does God change his mind? Does he ever change his course of action in response to anything a human being would do or for whatever reason? Does he change his mind? So, what do you guys think? First blush. Yes. Okay, we have a yes. Why? Occasionally. <laughs> because there's scriptures that I've looked at that as an interaction with humans, he, he appears to have changed his mind. So I, after looking at those scriptures and realizing he changed his course of action, he either did that, or in my mind, he would be sadistic, saying that he's going to do something and then not do it. So if he knew he was never going to do it, that just that doesn't compute in my my idea of who God would be. Gotcha. Okay. Any other thoughts? This is just our. When you hear the question, it's the first thing you think. This doesn't have to be your long-term opinion. I say yes. Okay. Yes. Why? Well, I remember um, the, the scripture 
when he destroyed the earth, Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. And then he came back and said he would never do that again. Mm -hmm. So and when he did it to begin with, he, I just, you know, he wanted to clean the earth from the heathens. And again, <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, the sadness was there. Mm -hmm. And the total destruction. And then mankind had to start again. And I, it just appeared to me that he changed his mind and decided that there would have to be a different course of action the next time he had to step in. I've noticed sort of a pattern, and I haven't done like a complete study on this by any means, but it seems like when God explicitly says in Scripture, I, you know, God is not a man that he should change his mind, it's when he's rebuking someone who thinks that they can change his mind by convincing him of something that he's probably already, you know, thought about and thought about the consequences and this and that. Mm -hmm. Kind of like manipulation, if we were trying to manipulate him. Mm -hmm. I think we all do that sometime in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> if you do this, I'll do this. <laughs> yeah. That's what they call God, it. I promise if you, if you give me this, I'm going to, I mean, that's, I remember kids praying like that. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, now see, here's the, here's the issue. When we talk about these major views, the majority of these have to say no. Mm -hmm. He cannot. He will not. Now, there are verses that appear to say he does, and there are also verses that appear to say he does not. Now, what I've done is that we're going to look at them chronologically, mm. not necessarily by time, but by scripture. Mm. Really, when you look at the pool of verses, the people say these are the verses that speak to the issue of whether God changes his mind or not. Uh, they're all in the Old Testament, mm. all of them. So we're going to look at them. The ones that say yes, apparently, the ones that apparently say no. Now, really quickly, I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to give you the cheat sheet as to what these things have to say on the issue. Hyper-Calvinism or fatalism would say, no, absolutely not, because God foreordains and controls everything. So what need would he have to change his mind? There would be none. It's ludicrous in the mind of the hyper-Calvinist. He cannot change his mind. There's no need for it. If it appears that he changes his mind, it was all really in his plan in the first place. It's just the appearance. That would be the opinion of a hyper-Calvinist. Reformed theology would say, no. No. No, there's no need for it. There's no need. God's will is sovereign. And furthermore, within Reformed theology, God also knows every action man will ever do. So there's no need to change his mind. There's no need to change his course of action because... He knows exactly what's going to happen, right? You don't need to change your course of action if you know what's going to happen, because you would have chosen the course of action in which you would not have had to change your mind in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So they would say no, absolutely not. If it appears that he is, well, the appearance is wrong. It's what you call an anthropomorphism <laughs> or an anthropopathism. Now we're getting into fun theological terminology. <laughs> Anthropomorphism would be a case in which something is given the form of a humanity in terms of literature. Mm. So I'm made to look like a man, I'm made to look like in the form of a man. So when you take that in terms of God, God in literature made to look in the form of a man. Mm. Not, in, not in the physical form, but with the same kind of thoughts or feelings or what have you. Mm. Anthropopathism is probably even the better term. That means ascribing to God feelings or suffering or thoughts that are of mankind. Mm -hmm. It's the belief that God is so completely and utterly different and beyond our understanding that we can't understand his, we, we can't even begin to relate with the way his thoughts or his actions or his feelings work. So if you see a thing that says, you know, God was angry, well, he's not really angry, it's just something that's beyond our ability to comprehend. And so it's whatever. Now there's a problem with that whole idea in that scripture exists for the sake of communication. That's what it's there for, to communicate truth. And if it doesn't actually mean what it says it means, then what does it mean? And why is it in there? It says, okay, God was sad. But he wasn't really sad, he was something totally different. But what does it mean then? Make sense? And why is it in there? It has to have a purpose. So anyway, that's 
Reformed theology's response, and Arminianism has the exact same response as Reformed theology, because this is a huge focus on foreknowledge, right? God knows everything, knows exactly what's going to happen, so there's no need for him to change his mind. Changing his mind would happen in response to something that, you know, changed the situation, but the situation was already set in God's mind. Make sense? Open theism would be the only one that would say yes for this particular question. Yes, he can change his mind because the future does not exist in terms of concrete reality, but is rather a dynamic thing, flowing with possibilities and contingencies and so on and so forth. Open theism would say, sure, that there are cases in which God should change his mind based on the free response of man. In other words, I'm going to destroy you. And man freely chooses to repent. And then God says, I'm not going to destroy you anymore. That would be an example that the open theist would say, yes, he does. This is their response, okay? Now let's look at the scriptures. Let's start at the beginning. And you brought this one up. We're in Genesis chapter 6. And this is the flood. And you guys, we're all fairly familiar with the story of the flood. But here's what God says, or here's what, here's what is said about God. <laughs> the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved to his heart in response to the wickedness that he saw on earth. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Okay, so thoughts. What do you guys think? Now, based on the question, does God repent or change his mind or relent or change his course of action? Yes. Yes, he's, why? Because he's sorry that he, made, that he made man. He regrets it. Regrets it. Now, to be fair, changing your course of action or changing your mind about something, being sorry or regretting that you've done something would fall into that category, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Now, looking at hyper-Calvinism, do you think that that works? No. Uh-uh. At the very least, you have problems with... Now, when, when I say you have problems with that, I don't mean this has to be wrong because it doesn't agree with this. What I mean is you can't take it at face value. Either there's some kind of special interpretation that this is a, what it appears to look like face value is wrong or hyper-Calvinism is wrong. But it could be one or the other. So what I mean is if you stand in this field, if you stand in that camp, you've got to really think hard about this verse because it appears to contradict the basic beliefs. Because how could God be sorry or regret something? Because he was the one who controlled them in doing the wickedness in the first place, according to hyper-Calvinism. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, what about Reformed theology? Yeah. No. Okay, why not? Again, because he, he um, you know, knew who was going to be okay, who was going to be saved and who wasn't, so why would he regret the ones who didn't. Yeah, right. He wouldn't have a sorrow over them because he already elected you know, his family to be the ones that he was going to save. Okay. Yeah, yeah. God having regret over an action is problematic for Reformed theology, but it could sort of work, depending. Because uh, Reformed theology doesn't believe that God can makes all people sin. It believes that all people are totally depraved. And because of their total depravity, they naturally sin. And so God could be regretting and be sad or sorry for the wickedness they continue to do under total depravity. So that okay. could make sense. But do, if, if the theory is that he chooses the ones he wants to save, how could he regret the ones that didn't follow him? Yeah, no, that, that is an issue. And an even bigger issue would be the fact that, once again, just like with Armenianism, and this is the same problem Armenianism would have with this verse, God knew that this was going to happen, according to Reformed theology and Armenianism. God knew as a certainty, the moment he made man, that this would happen and that he would send the flood and have to kill all of them. 
He, he knew it. The future was concrete according to these, well, all three of these, really. So why the sorrow or the regret? Why, why being grieved? Why would he regret a choice when he knew that this would be the outcome? Make sense? Mm -hmm. It's strange. Once again, not impossible to deal with, but strange. What would be the fatalist explanation of that? The fatalist explanation for this? The fatalist explanation would be something like the sorrow and the regret and the wickedness of man, all of it was just in God's plan. Mm. Almost like a dance. Mm. And so it's sorrow, but it's sorrow is part of the plan. He was regretting, but his regret was part of the plan in the first place. So kind of like when you watch a sad movie that you've already seen and you know it's going to make you feel sad, but it still makes you feel sad anyway. Well, that would be over, <laughs> over here. Okay. Now, these are the ones where I've already seen it. Mm -hmm. I knew it was coming. Yeah. This would be, I'm literally making this happen. Mm. This is a little harder. Well, this would be, yeah, I, I knew it was coming, but now that it's actually happening, um, it hurts. Mm. Now, that helps with the, the word sorry, mm -hmm. but the word regret is really difficult. Mm. Because regret means I made a decision, and now because of the way it's turned out, I wish I hadn't made it. That's what regret means. So that's a difficult term based on these two. You've got to really figure things out. Would the fall fall into that category? Yes. I mean, from the very beginning. <coughs> yes, what, what is... I mean, the fall of man mm -hmm. choosing, wouldn't that fall into the same category as this? I mean, he regretted he, the plan he had for man didn't come to fruition because they chose the other Well, way. but where does it say that? In the Bible. Uh -huh. That's true. It doesn't. So for all we know, he, he either was controlling it, it's part of his plan, or he knew it was going to happen. And therefore it was sort of part of the plan. Hmm. Make sense? I hate you, but that's the thing. Here is where he says, I regret. That's the problematic term for these three. Now, what about open theism? Open theism has no problem. They would say, uh, the open theist would say, God created man, man had total free will, God interacted with man, and man freely chose stupidity and wickedness, even spiting God's love and spiting the good choice. And that God based on the, the free choices of mankind, he, he regretted. I regret making you guys. I regret giving you the free choice. Now that would be the open theist perspective. So this verse doesn't pose a problem for them. Now there are gonna be other verses that do. But this particular verse, they can take this one at face value. There's no need to try to find some kind of, whether it's try to wiggle out of it or whether it's find a true meaning deeper. One, two, three would have to do that, whereas open theism would not. Make sense? Now how does that regret, how does that translate from the Greek? Well, Hebrew. That, or the Hebrew. And now you can do the Greek because of the Septuagint, okay. which is closer, but I am not a Hebraist. Okay. I'm a Greek scholar. So I couldn't tell you from the Hebrew, okay. um, from first blush. Uh, the, I know the term, what is really tricky is, no, what's really interesting, possibly, the one thing I do know of the Hebrew in this section, with the word grieved, is uh, it's expressive of intense, like if something were to grab your heart and squeeze it, like getting the breath knocked out of you, <gasps> like that kind of thing, it's that kind of feeling when it's, when it's used as a human being. That makes sense. It's a very powerful word. Very powerful kind of grief. That makes sense. Oh. Yes. I'm looking at some of the footnotes and some of the references. Um, and the one thing that seems, not seems, is predominant is restoration. That God knew it and he had to restore through the Holy Spirit. 
Let me just read one here. And this is um, this is one of the references was um, six five Genesis. Man's plunge into degradation, restoration. Um, chapters four through twelve reveal man's plunge into degradation and his absolute need for redemption and restoration. The entire concept of the Holy Spirit and restoration is developed in the study article, and it gives other references. So it seems like from the beginning that God needed to restore what was fatal. Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. you know, he knew then <laughs> that it had to be restored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and once again, you have different perspectives from each one of these views. That makes sense. Hyper-Calvinism would say the fall and the degradation and then the eventual restoration was all part of the plan from the very beginning. Reformed yeah. theology would say man's free choices made it so God had to restore and the restoration happens because God chooses some and not others. But he knew that it would happen. Yeah. Arminianism would say the same thing. He knew that the fall and man pulling away from man was going to happen but he's still trying to pull everyone into restoration from well, him. Yeah, and because there's other, other um, the story of Joseph's life is a grand foreshadowing of God's restoration process, especially of those whose loss is the result of their being victimized by others. The entire concept of the Holy Spirit and restoration is developed in the study, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he gave us the free will depending on which view you have. Well. Because over here would say no. Yeah, no free will. Over here would say, you have the ability to come to God if God chooses you. That breaks my heart. Um, to me, that's it. Well, I thought we were all God's children. We, we, we choose to reject him, but he gave gave birth to all of us as his children and the thought that he wouldn't accept some of us back. Why would he do that? And that's yeah, where yeah. here and here would say the exact same thing. Yes. They would say here or here would be a picture of a wicked God choosing some and not others. Well, now, here's the thing, here's the thing. It doesn't matter how we feel. Yeah. yeah. What matters is what's true. Now, I'm not telling you what is true. No. I'm not telling you where I stand. I stand very strongly in one of these areas. Yeah. But I don't want to sit up here and tell you, here's where I stand, guys, so that you can be pulled this way or that. Well, Nate's done all the studying, and Nate knows what he <laughs> believes, and now I believe what he'll believe. I don't want you walking out of here believing something because I believe it. Make sense? We have to study. We, yes. we have to figure it out for ourselves. Now here's the thing, maybe, maybe God only chooses some and not others. Maybe he pulls all people to him freely. Maybe he pulls all people to him freely but knows who's going to choose him and who's not going to choose him. We're going to be looking at that. That's actually the next major area after this question, as far as does God relent, does God change his course? The next area is, did Jesus die for everyone? Does God want everyone saved or only some? Because up here, the answer is no. Jesus did not die for everyone. He only wants some saved. Down here, the answer is yes. So what does the Bible say? Because once again, there are some verses that appear to say God wants everyone saved. There are some verses that appear to say God chooses some. They're not both right. So we've got to look at them. Anyway, um, moving forward, because we're like on verse 1 out of... 30 verses. Um, Arminianism would have problems with this. Just like these, these top three, open theism would not. This particular verse uh, jives best with open theism at a face value. Okay? This is not me saying open theism is right. It's me saying for this particular verse, it jives best with this. And unless there's... Now, here's, here's my thing. I haven't found a better explanation than the face value for this particular verse. If it exists, I haven't found it. That is not me saying, I'm an open theist. That's me giving you my opinion of this verse. Not, my, not even my opinion. That's me saying, I haven't found a... I, I haven't found it. It's there yet. 
Make sense? Okay, let's move on. This is another fun one. Exodus 32. Anyone know the context of Exodus 32? I read it last week. Uh, this is the Israelites in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. right. Moses goes on top of Mount Sinai to receive the law. And while he's up there, the Israelites get stupid. Mm -hmm. And they build a calf. They start worshiping some god, they, they, a golden calf they made. And God sees what's going on and he says, I am going to wipe them out. He says, I'm going I'm to forget the Israelites. Moses, I'm going to work my plan through you. You, specifically. Not these other guys. They've turned away from me over and over and over again. I'm, I'm done with them. And here's what Moses says. Moses argues with God. He says, why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent, God brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth. He appeals to God's opinion among pagan people. Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. And the Lord relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. So God said, I'm going to do this. Moses argued with them, gave him requests, and God relented. Now, I can tell you what the Hebrew word for relent is here. It's nakam. Nakam which is, interestingly enough, the same exact word that is used in Hebrew for human beings repenting from sin. Now, what it means, this is not me saying God repented from sin, but what the word means is turning around. Complete turnaround, a, a 180. Uh, well, there's no... N-A-C-H-E-M. N-A-C-H-E-M would be the closest English okay. spelling. There's no real way to spell it because it's... Right. You know, it's Hebrew. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, nakem. And it's the same word that use, is used whenever a human being turns from a course of action. Right. Repent just means to turn 180 degrees and do something else, go somewhere else. So God here turns from a course of action. Apparently. Mm. Or maybe not. Uh, what do you guys think? First blush. Yeah, this is one of the big ones. Wasn't going to say that he was going to wipe them out if he didn't mean it. Yeah, and this is what's really hard. is because God said, I'm going to do this. And then Moses said something, and God said, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. Now, was God lying when he said he was going to do it? Because if he knew that he was not going to do it, why would he say that he was going to do it? That's a lie, right? God doesn't lie. And he doesn't lie. We know that much. So it's difficult. So once again, could he have just been trying to make his point to Moses that this he, is really just how mad I am? That is exactly what these two would say. God was trying to elicit a response from Moses. Hmm. However, that seems like manipulation through a lie, yeah. doesn't it? I would say it was more teaching. Possibly. I wouldn't. Say God doesn't lie. I automatically. God doesn't lie. So Absolutely. Go that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe so, that's yeah. the thing. You, you can't allow a lie in the equation. Sometimes you have to um, really put it in somebody's face to get them to look at it. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what Reformed theology and meaning is. I'm going to the worst. Now you tell me what, I sh what you think I should do. Mm -hmm. Give me ideas so yeah. that they can think for themselves. Yeah. Teaching man what to do. Yeah, and that, that's, ex that's exactly what these two would say. He was trying to elicit a response. He wasn't really going to destroy uh, the Israelites. He was never really going to. He just wanted Moses to argue with them. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the problem with that view, and this is where the open theists would say that doesn't work. They would say the word relent actually means turning from a course of action that you were going to do. Well, he did turn. But, it, but he didn't really because he was never planning on doing it. Right? Mm -hmm. If he was really planning on doing it, but he knew he wasn't going to do it. See the problem? Now, it's something we have to think about, right? Because if I say, I mean, just, just think with me for a second. If I really want my son to, I don't know, do the garbage, 
do the garbage, take out the garbage. My son is way too young to take out the garbage. He's two. <laughs> what if he was 10? And I said, son, take out the garbage. And they didn't take out the, he didn't take out the garbage and so on and so forth. And I say, <laughs> okay, that's it. I am taking away, like you, you are no longer allowed to go see any of your friends for a month. You're not, that's it, you're no longer allowed. I'm doing this. And then he said, oh God, here's the reasons why you shouldn't do this. And I said, okay, I've changed my mind. I'm not gonna take away your freedom like that. Now, if I knew that I was never really gonna take away his freedom, well, then I've elicited the response, which is good, right? I got him to repent. I got my, my son to respond to me. But when I said I was going to do it, if I, never, if I wasn't actually ever going to do it, you see the issue, right? You would have done it if he didn't start obeying. Maybe, right? right. Now, what if Moses had not said anything? Right. What would God have done? We, we, we don't know. Who knows? Would he maybe have destroyed the Israelites? I don't know. Anyway, bottom line, hyper-Calvinism makes us into a weird kind of dance where God says, I'm going to destroy them, and then he controls Moses into responding to him, and he responds. So it's, it's strange. But if that's what you believe, then okay. Reform, theology, and Arminianism have to deal with this the same way. God can't really be changing his mind according to these views, because he knew he was never going to be doing it. So he was just saying that he was going to do it, even though he never intended to, to elicit the response. That's what these two would say. Now, whether or not that is problematic, you need to think about it yourself. Open theism, once again, this is an, an easy verse for open theists. They would say, God said, I'm going to do this. But upon respecting Moses' request, because God genuinely interacts with us, he, again, Moses said, don't do this, please. None of this was news to God. He wasn't argued out of his decision. He said, okay, you want this, Moses? I'm going to work with you. So he didn't do it. That would be where the open theist would stand. That one's interesting. Any questions before I move on to one that stands on the opposite side of things? Your son, if you told him you were going to take away his freedom and he tested you on that and you didn't, then don't you think the next time would be that much easier for him to not obey you? I mean, I would think if God said he was going to do something and man didn't respond, then, he, you know, it'd be a lot easier not to fear him or trust what he's saying if he doesn't follow through. Possibly. Now, Hyper-Calvinism, there's no fear of that because God is going to control their response either way. Reformed theology and Arminianism, there's no fear of that because God knows how they're going to respond, period. So God knew that if he said this, Moses would respond that way and then he would not do it. So there was never any danger. Was, he was never really going to destroy the Israelites according to those two views. Make sense? I just, again... <laughs> I'm not telling you anything here, aside from where these things stand, and aside from what's going on in the verse. All I'm giving you is things to think about. You can think about it with an open mind, wanting to know the truth. Make sense? Yeah. Let's move on, unless you have a question. I have a couple of things. Um, one, in um, um, in 14, he said, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Um, Moses um, showed his character to God because he was praying for them that God would not kill them. And then um, in, in one of my notes on the bottom, it says, 32, 14, relented means Move to pity. It shows the tension that exists between God's judgment and mercy. His decision was not totally reversed, merely tempered. I don't know that I would agree with that note. If that makes sense. Because, it does. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it's everybody's opinion. Once again, yeah, one thing about just, commentaries yeah. is they were written by a human being. That's true. So maybe he's right on. 
but maybe he's not. You gotta be careful with all that. Um, just like you have to be careful with my opinion, because I'm also yeah. a human being. I'm gonna look at other commentaries. Sure, please. I recommend Matthew Henry and Albert Barnes. They both have very solid commentaries in the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, and it's free online because yeah. they're dead and it's free, uh, free to use. <laughs> very okay. old I mean, commentaries. It's, it's, it's good to look at the commentaries sure. because it, uh, I would never have thought of it. I would never have thought of that. Hmm. Yeah, commentaries can be, I mean, we, we went over uh, ways to study the Bible a few months ago. And commentaries are one thing that I recommend with a healthy skepticism. Yeah. Not a critical spirit, but a healthy skepticism. Because you're a human being reading a human being's opinion. Right. Maybe they're right on, but maybe they're not. Because here's the thing. If you take 100 commentaries, 50 are going to say one thing, and 50 will say the absolute opposite thing. Yeah, but then we have to decide which, which is fits for us. All right. Now, again, there's only one right answer. Right. Not easy. And this is what we're called to. So do you think we're going to find the right answer? I think, we, I think we can, and we have to seek it. Okay. Yeah, I think we absolutely can. Okay, good. Because I'm totally confused. <laughs> it's not that bad. It really isn't. It's not. And this is what we're, this is what we're doing here. Um, these verses mean only one thing. Either God actually turned from his course of action, which is what this word implies, yeah. or he didn't. So let's move on to another verse here, because this one says something totally different, or appears to. Nope, that's not the right one. This is out of order. There we go. Numbers 23, verse 19. Numbers 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. So here it says, God does He's not a son of man that he should repent. Now, this is once again that word, and I can. Really? Yeah. He's not a son of man that he should repent. Uh, why we have to be, we have to think about this hard, because here's a verse that says, God is not a son of man that he should repent, while there are other verses that says, God nakhemmed. So they can't both be right. So what do you guys think? How does that fit into the context of that? Chapter. That's a good question. Yeah, but basically, it's this one guy who's basically leading a prophet around and saying, I'm going to perform your ceremonies so that I can have my way and appease mm -hmm. your gods so that I can do something really nasty. And he's saying, well, he's not going to do that no matter how many times you do the ceremony. <laughs> right. So there's a guy named Balak and a guy named Balaam. And bottom line, what's happening here is Balaam is a prophet. <coughs> And this pagan king wants Balaam to speak a curse over Israel so that Israel will lose its battle. And so Balaam was kind of going back and forth. He was saying, okay, well, uh, I'm now a blessing over these guys. And now, okay, now because you're paying me more money or because you're pressuring me, now I'm cursing them. and kind of going back and forth. I'm kind of speaking something out because he's being pressured by human beings. Um, Balaam was being pressured by Balak to curse Israel. That's what's happening here. It was, Balaam was kind of flip-flopping. And in the end, God said, I'm not going to respond to your blessings and curses because I'm not like you. Make sense? Yeah. So hyper-Calvin would say, awesome. Perfect. God does not lie and God does not repent. At face value, hyper-Calvinism loves this. Reformed theology, good. There's no need for God to repent because he knows everything that's going to happen according to Reformed theology. Same thing with Arminianism. No need for it. So this is good. Open theism? Mm. Problems, right? <laughs> At least apparently problems. <clears throat> because open theism holds like one of the core tenets is that God can freely respond to our free choices. And so because our free choices can change the situation, sometimes God needs to change his course based on our free choices. Mm. Like when God regrets making us because we chose to do stupid things. Or like when Moses freely requests of God, can we please work this way through the Israelites? And God says, okay, I'm not gonna, I'll do it your way. So this is a problem that he says, I'm, he does not repent. And so we've got to think about this. The only 
explanation that I could find, because once again, whenever I, whenever I run into an issue with one of these, say, okay, hyper-Calvinism, I've a problem with this verse. I try to find the smartest people who are hyper-Calvinists and see what they have to say on it. And I try to present it to you guys. Sometimes I find answers that are so pitiful that I won't even share them with you. Because it, it strikes me as just wiggling it, their way out of something. Not just for hyper-Calvinism, but for any of these. Other times, if there's a, an answer that I see, well, actually, that, that is a possibility, or even a remote possibility, I'll share it with you. Like what I said over here, with these two saying that God wasn't really going to kill the Israelites, he was trying to elicit a response. To me, I, the, that, that interpretation, to me, is not likely. But it's possible. So what? I'm sharing it with you. Over here, these three, perfect. This is, a, 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 you know, it, it, it's right in line with their, uh, their tenets. Open theism has problems. Open theism would say the only explanation that I've heard from the open theist camp would be that this is specifically referring, it, it, it's, it's drawing a contrast between the wickedness of Balaam, flip-flopping back and forth, lying for the sake of human beings and repenting and changing his mind for the sake of human beings, and God himself and his consistency for his plan. In other words, open theism would say that this is saying that God, he does not lie or turn from his commitment to bless Israel in spite of Balak's pressure. Uh, so men can be pressured into compromising and deceiving with lies and flip-flopping, but God never will. That is the only open theist response I've been able to find. Whether that's adequate or not, I'll leave it up to your guys' thoughts. But these three have no problem at all with the face value of this. Wouldn't it also be, um, he, could, he would repent when it's true to his nature? So repenting um, to harm Say again? his people? Repenting to what? Repenting to harm his people would not be in his nature. God, the character of God it would go against God's character. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any, I don't think any of these would have any problem with God changing his mind if not changing his mind was in conflict with his nature or character. The thing is, with these three, there would never be any case in which that is, well, in which that would happen. He controls everything. At the very least, he knows what will happen. So he's always going to choose exactly what's in line with that. Make sense? But open theism would say, yeah, yeah, um, if it was against God's character, if he needed to change his course of action to be in line with his character, then he's going to. Make sense? But for the most part, open theism would say, no, he doesn't lie or repent or flip-flop back and forth from his purposes and his commitment to Israel. But again, that's the only explanation I found in this camp over here. Up to you guys to be thinking about it and coming to your own conclusions. These three have no problem with the face value. Uh, moving on, we have a really fun little section of verses in 1 Samuel. We actually were going to do three verses in a row. Well, not in a row, but in the same chapter. Here we have God referring to Saul. And you guys know the story of Saul, the first king of Israel. God apparently did not want Saul, or did not want a king for Israel. Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. And it was uh, in response to their request for a king, and he said, he, it seemed to say that he gave in, okay, fine, you guys can have a king. And he made Saul the king, and then way later in Saul's life, Saul kind of goes off the deep end. And God says this, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel, the prophet, who uh, blessed Saul as king uh, for God, was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. So here we have something that seems that God regrets his course of action in making Saul king. I should not have made Saul king. But then, the next verse down, not the next verse down, 18 verses later, we have a totally different statement. He says, The glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he, will, he should change his mind. Huh. 18 verses later. So in verse 11, it says, I regret that I've made Saul king, but over here it says, the glory of Israel, that's God, will not lie or change his mind. 
Not a man that he should change his mind. Okay, so let's go the next verse down. Well, not the next verse. Six verses later. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. <sighs> this is not an easy string of verses. Because it seems like 11 and 35 contradict, what is it, 29? 29. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on? What do you guys think? Any thoughts? Yeah, I think we have to go through the whole, yeah. all the in-between verses and look at the context. Because if I remember correctly, Saul repented out of wanting to get his way. He didn't really come with a heart of repentance hmm. for his actions. That's the take I have on the scriptures when I read them. When he realized he lost God's favor, he just did it to get God's favor back rather than truly repenting of his actions. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Hyper-Calvinism has a problem with 11 and 35. Hmm. The idea that God would regret making Saul king and the idea that God repent that he would make Saul king. Those are both very problematic words. So it would have to be saying that that isn't really what was happening. So regardless of what the Bible is saying, that's not really what was happening in the Calvinist mindset or the hyper-Calvinist mindset. Do they have an explanation for that? It would just be all part of the plan. <laughs> so God isn't really repenting, but it's the appearance of repenting that was all part of the controlling the human response and so on and so forth. That would be the hyper response. However, verse 29 is great. God doesn't lie. God does not repent. Or does not change his mind, was the term. Really good for hyper -Calvinism. Reformed theology, and you'll find that for this particular issue, Reformed theology and Arminianism are, like, they have the same exact response every time. Once you get into, does God want all saved, or election, or prophecy, or whatever else, very different. But for this issue, it comes down to foreknowledge, and knowing what's going to happen. So, similar problems to up here. God, why would God regret making Saul king if he knew Saul was going to do this exact thing all along? Why would God repent for making Saul king if he knew all this stuff was going to happen all along? However, verse 29 works nice. God does not lie. God does not change his mind like a man. And finally, open theism, 11 and, 11 and 35 are right in line with the tenets of open theism. God made, the open theist would say that God made Saul king because he was the best man for the job at that time. But Saul's free choices disqualified him from the position. And he made stupid choices, and so God regretted making him king. God repented for making him king. But then we have verse 29 that says he doesn't change his mind. So which is it? I have a silly question. Sure. In the beginning, Saul didn't want to be king. He said, there, I, he didn't want to be king. He said there should be no kings. God. God said, there should be no kings. Mm -hmm. And Saul said, I, yes, I want to be king. Well, the people said, we want a king. Okay. The people said, the Israelites said, we want a king like all the other nations around us. Give us a king. And so, according to scripture, God said, okay, you can have a king. Mm -hmm. And using uh, Samuel, he chose the best man for the job. The most righteous man in Israel, Saul. Well, he thought he was the most righteous man. Well, either God was wrong or he really was. <laughs> so was God wrong about Saul? My brain is fried. This is worth thinking about. <laughs> we're we're going to be done here in a minute, so don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> right. Now, you see, here's the thing. God is no dummy. Okay? I don't think God is ever wrong about anything. I think he knows reality exactly as it is. Now, 
depending on where you stand here, is what you view about the future and whether it's all one giant certainty or whether God controls it all or whether it's open to free choices. So, bottom line is, regardless of where you stand, Saul was the best man for the job at the time God chose him. Now, either God knew all along that Saul was going to mess up, which is problematic, at least by that interpretation, or he was the best man for the job and then made stupid decisions of his own free will, which would work for some of these verses, but 29 doesn't, doesn't appear to jive with that. Make sense? Mm. This is hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard. And here's the thing. I have been approached by atheists who know this stuff, who know the Bible better than most Christians do. And so what do we do when they come and say, now which is it? We go, uh, I haven't thought about it. We gotta think about it. Now to be fair, not all atheists are intellectual meatheads. A lot of them, the majority of them, it's become uh, trendy now to be an atheist. So the majority of them are as much in the dark as the average churchgoer. <laughs> but not all of them. It is, it's very sad. But not all of them. We, we have to be thinking. That's the Alpha class. I like the Alpha class. The, one, the pastor that, that teaches the Alpha class used to be an atheist. Hmm. And then one day he read the Bible to himself. <laughs> oh, you mean he finally... Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not the flood, the man who wrote. Who oh, 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 yes. yes. Oh, the Alpha, yes. yes. I can't remember. Mickey Gumble. Yes. Nice. And he what he proclaims to have been an atheist. Hmm. And then he read and studied, and his whole life turned around. Yeah. So I mean, we, we, we got we got to think about this because now he can't both. If eleven and thirty five are right that he regretted his choice and that he repented of making Saul king, then twenty nine is not right at face value which says he does not change his mind. But if 29 at face value is right, then 11 and 35 can't be right at face value. They can't both be, make sense? They're contradictory. So this would say it was really all part of the plan to begin with. And it appears that he's repenting, but he's not really. Over here, these would say that this is anthropopathism, that he appears it says that he regrets, and it says that he repents, um, but it's really just ascribing human emotions and thoughts and stuff to God that's not really there for the sake of helping us understand what he's like. I, I still have the same problem with anthropopathism because it has to mean something. Okay, it's helping us understand what he's like, but if he's not really experiencing regret or changing his mind, then what, what does it mean? And I haven't found a satisfactory answer for that one. Um, but that's what they would say over here. Um, and so for 35, open theism is good. For 29, these three are totally good. He doesn't change his mind. And open theism runs into a wall. Now, I'll, I'll just tell you what's happening here very quickly. And then we will maybe look at one more and then end. Um, bottom line, Saul starts acting crazy and doing doing things that God explicitly told him not to do. And so God says, okay, that's it. And he says over here in verse 11, I regret that I've made Saul king because he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commandments. This statement, because Saul did this stuff. I I regret that he's no longer the right man for the job, okay? This is what he says. This is what God says. So then Samuel gets sent to Saul and tell Saul, you're done. God's favor is no longer with you. The anointing as king has been taken off you from God. And so, like you said, uh, he starts, uh, Saul starts freaking out a little bit. He recognizes that he needs the anointing. He needs God's blessing. And so he says, well, Samuel, please bless me so that God will bless me. Forgive me so that God will forgive me. Because that's kind of how it worked back then with prophets and representation of God. And Samuel, or Saul, uh, sorry, Samuel said no and turned away to leave. Okay, so he was, he's walking out on Saul. Saul reaches forward and grabs Samuel's robe, like stay. And then his robe rips. 
And so it's at that point that Samuel turns back to him and says this, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind. He is not a man that he should change his mind. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Now that, that's, that's what happened. Now over here, these three would say he just doesn't change his mind, period. The open theist response would be referring specifically to God flip-flopping on his decision to remove the anointing. That's the only open theist response that I could find. As this is referring specifically, he's not going to change his mind about removing the anointing anointing from you. Um, And then, six verses later, Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So that's that's the story. Um, Read Samuel, or 1 Samuel 15 for yourself. Look over it. Make your decision. Or at least think about it. Um, Because it's very worth thinking about. I think I need to grab my, I need to wrap my head around each, each one of those to really understand what they mean. Because I'm looking, what, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And, and now, I'm trying to... It was... The week two video really helped, because I was absent for that week as well. And, maybe uh, that's it. Maybe yeah. I need to just... And, that, and that's the thing. Is YouTube it. The, <laughs> the summary I had to give you guys in five, ten minutes is not adequate. Mm-hmm. adequate. Right. It isn't. These are complex. Yeah. It was very surface level. We spent an entire classroom session discussing the definitions of these views and their beliefs. So we have the video. It's on uh, YouTube, Life Churches and Beach, mm-hmm. the Life Churches and Beach channel, or on our website, lifechurchjb.com, under teachings. Um, either one, we have the video online, the whole class, um, and we go into in depth. So all that can help. And, and again, um, I really encourage any of you who haven't been in here for the last few weeks and who plan on continuing being in here, we're going to be on this subject for at least a couple more weeks, mm-hmm. um, looking at other questions. And I, I encourage you to go check it out for yourself and get caught up, if that makes sense. All this stuff is valuably looking at, period. But it helps to have the background. So really quickly, I'm going to do one more, since we're already 10 minutes past the hour. And I try to be done at... <laughs> I try to be done here. We're going to look at, let's say, there's one really interesting one. Okay, I like this one. This one's very, uh, this one's pretty challenging. This is in Jeremiah chapter 18. And God says, he uses some really difficult terminology. He uses words like if. And if can be a pretty serious challenge because either there are ifs or there are not ifs in God's mind. If there are no ifs, then he shouldn't be using the term if, because there are no ifs. You understand what I mean? Yeah. We're talking about contingency and possibility or certainty. So God says, if that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I, pr- I plan to bring on it. If it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good I intended to do to it. So here you have a pretty simple if-then mm. form. If, and then there's the then, it's implied. If, then. Uh, so the, the problem here is, um, hyper-Calvinism, there really is no if. He's just making a statement that doesn't mean anything. Because he's going to do what he's going to do. For here and here, uh, you also have problems, because there really is no if in God's mind. He knows what they're going to do. Now, this could still work technically, okay? Because, uh, well, he's just saying that. And he's just telling them what his character's like, but he knows what they're going to do. So if they would relent, then he would, if they would repent, then he would change his course of action, but he knows they're not going to, or he knows they are going to, or what so, you know, so on and so forth. As we have this illusion of choice, he wants us to be like, (laughs) to consider doing the right thing. (laughs) But God knows, and he has to communicate to us. And his, his intelligence is beyond what we can even comprehend. And he has to present it to us in a language that we can understand. So using the word if is his presentation to man. If you do this, these are your consequences. If you choose to do this, these would be your consequences. Mm-hmm. So but why is he, pres- why is he telling us that? To teach. 
God so for for the sake of like trying to well trying to bring us well. <laughs> right so for for the sake of trying to bring us like and this is what it right. is our choice to make right so for the sake of trying to help us make good choices right Correct. he wants us to he, like when he's this is he's referring to Israel here Jeremiah is all this is right before not Israel but you guys you guys know the northern and southern kingdom split you had Israel Ephraim and then the southern kingdom Judah. And Israel was carried off by Assyria. Mm. And then all you had left was Judah. And then Judah fell to wickedness and Babylon carried them off. The Babylonian exile. This is right there in the Babylonian exile. Okay? Mm. And this is right when this is starting to happen. And God is saying, if you guys turn from your evil, I'm going to relent concerning the calamity. And by the way, the calamity is the Babylonian exile. I'll relent concerning that calamity I plan to bring against it. But if you don't, I'm not going to bring any good to you either. So here's the thing. You would say that he's trying to elicit a response of repentance. Mm -hmm. He's trying to elicit that response based on free will. That doesn't work here. <laughs> Definitely not. That doesn't work here either because of total depravity. Because they couldn't do it unless he gave them the ability to do it. Right. Now over here, we have free will, right? Arminianism. We have free will. And so he's trying to respond, like, call to our free will. Problem is, he knows, he knows if they're going to turn or not. Right, but he's not saying that there. There's mm -hmm. not a question of that. Right. But it appears, based on, some, based on face value, mm -hmm. that he's calling them to a level of repentance. Which they would never do. They didn't do. They made their choice. Right. So he's not getting the response he wanted to get. Now maybe this is for future even, generations. Even if he knew they weren't going to listen, he was making it clear that you're doing this to yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so this is exactly where he would fall. Arminianism would say this about that verse. Yeah. This wasn't... It wasn't in hopes of them repenting because he knew they weren't going to repent hmm. but he was at least telling them how he worked you're not going to repent I know you're not going to repent but it, you know I, I would relent if you did repent that's where Armenianism would fall so you can actually have a, a Armenianism would you can you, you have to work a little bit to make this fit but it can um, open theism for this verse uh, once again, probably wouldn't have any problems here. Because it's an actual if. If you repent, I'll do this, and that's a possibility. If you don't repent, I'll do this, and that's a possibility as well. So that one flows. Problems, uh, once again, problems up here as well. But these two can jive. And let me look very briefly to see if there's anything else I really wanted to mention. I'll look at one more, maybe. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> there's so many good ones. I'll just read one really... <sighs> okay, I'll, I'll go give you... I'm just going to give you guys something to read for yourself, okay? There's a lot of uh, really interesting uh, things in Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremiah 26, verse 3. I'll just read it for you and we won't discuss it. He says, Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way that I may repent of the calamity which I am planning to do to them because of their evil deeds. Perhaps they will listen. And everyone will turn from his evil way that I may repent of the calamity I'm planning to bring to them. Jeremiah 26, 3. Read over it. Read the context. The difficult word there is the word perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Go ahead and read Jonah. Probably the whole book of Jonah. <laughs> it's short. It's only four chapters. But Jonah, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 specifically. I'll just read it. Uh, Can you say 
Jonah, uh -huh. chapter 3, mm -hmm. verses 9 and 10. And this is the king of Assyria. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, so the king of Assyria. Uh, when Jonah came and said, God is going to destroy you, there was no if. There was no unless you repent. God is going to destroy you. Uh, the king said, uh, the king called for repentance in the whole nation. He said, who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. It's Jonah chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Read over that one. And finally, this one's really long, but read over, there's two different places in the Bible. Read over the entire chapter of 2 Kings 20. This is a story of Hezekiah, or a story of mm -hmm. King Hezekiah, where, and I'll just give you the summary and the difficult part. Um, Hezekiah became sick, and he was on the point of death. God sent Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, to him and said, uh, get, your, get your house in order because you're going to die. You're not going to recover from this sickness. And then Isaiah went to leave. And Hezekiah immediately, uh, got, he turned his face to the wall and said, uh, Lord, please remember how I walk before you in faithfulness with the whole heart. Please remember what I have done good in your, that I have done good in your sight. And he said, Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah even got out of the, the main court of the kingdom, or of the, 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 uh, the palace, castle, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, God showed up to him and said, turn back, go back to Hezekiah and say, I've heard your prayer, I've seen your tears, behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord and I will add 15 years to your life. So read over that one. Think about it. The difficult part there is he seems to have responded to something. He seems to have said, you're going to die. This is what's going to happen. Isaiah prayed, and it seems like he changed his mind. That's the difficult part. Think about that. Um, and I believe, finally read Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 14. I'm sorry, chapter. Ezekiel chapter 24. Verse 14, and probably need to read the whole chapter 24 to read this in context. Uh, but it says, I am the Lord, I have spoken, it shall come to pass, I will do it. I will not go back, I will not spare, I will not relent. According to your ways and according to your deeds, you'll be judged, declares the Lord God. Lord God. So the difficult part there, the part we need to think about, is where he very clearly says, I will not go back on what I've said, I will not spare, I will not relent. So I'll be reading that and be thinking about that as well. And oh, everything goes so much slower than I want to go. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at a whole new section of questions. Sweet. <laughs> Um, depending on, de depending, we're either going to look at the question of did Jesus die for everyone? Does God want all to be saved or only some? Or we're going to look at the question uh, of prophecy in the Bible. And so that's all. Any questions or thoughts before we close? I have one thought. Please. The word grace comes to mind over all of these questions. Other than the word, but I mean, I don't know where it fits. Hmm. I just. You see, here's what's cool. This is not. These aren't salvation issues. Right. Our relationship with God is what matters. Oh. Now, these things can be valuable for our relationship with God and helping us understand Him deeper, and it can be valuable for our ability to evangelize. We're called to be able to be able to provide a defense, to be able to understand. It's a time for understanding. Um, but I think when all is said and done, God is not going to turn us out because we didn't have the correct view. Right. Make sense? We made the attempt. I, I, think, I think God 
Well, Jesus says this in John 17, chapter 3. No. John chapter 17, verse 3. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God. Know there is the Greek word gnosko, which means experiential relationship, experiential, experiential knowledge. So what Jesus cared about was that we have a relationship with God, we have a relationship with him. That's, that's what really matters. And everything else is subject to that greater purpose. So again, we're not talking about this stuff because we gotta figure it out or our lives are gonna fall apart or we're we're not really Christians. But this is stuff that's worth thinking about for the sake of answering our own questions and answering the questions of the world. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just clearing up a whole bunch of stuff. (laughs) And what's cool is, what is cool is once we finish talking about this, uh, the nature of God, we get to move on to discussing uh, things that very closely relate to how we live our daily lives. Mm-hmm. It's important to have this as a foundation to move forward and discuss other issues. But then we get to talk about what, what is sin. Mm-hmm. What is sin? What is our ability to choose victory over sin? Or are we slave to it? Or, or to what degree do we have the ability to resist it? And then we get to go into what is salvation? What does that entail? What does relationship with God look like on a daily level? Are there conditions to it? Or is it something that we're picked for or do we freely have to choose it or so on and so forth uh, so these are foundational questions we get to move forward and I'm excited to move forward so thanks guys thank you, thank you. Thank you.